Cancer Council New South Wales acknowledges the traditional custodians, both past and present, on the lands on which we live and work. Hello and welcome. My name is Jill Mills and tonight we will be talking about returning to work after treatment for bowel cancer. First, some housekeeping. If you experience any technical problems, you can either mention them in the chat box, which is down the right-hand side of your screen, or you can call the 1800 number um, that is also listed there. So if you have any sound problems, you can listen using your phone by dialing the 1800 number shown in the chat box and then the passcode which is provided. We want to hear from you in the chat box tonight and we encourage you to participate, support each other, tell us what you thought about the information presented, can you relate or not, was the information useful to you, would you actually do any of the things mentioned etc. Also if you have any questions please type them into the chat box. This webinar is being recorded and everyone who registered will be sent a link to the recording. So don't worry if you get distracted by the chat, you can watch the presentation later. So if at any stage you need to speak to someone urgently, please do not hesitate to contact a Lifeline counsellor on 13 11 14, which is available 24 seven. So let's get started. Firstly, I would like to introduce our panel. So next to me is Ben Bravery and Naomi Houston and Dr. Catherine Hodgkinson. Welcome everybody. So Annie Miller is monitoring the chat box tonight, so please say hello to her. And now I'm gonna hand over to Ben, and I'm gonna push the mouse across. <laughs> Thank there you. We go. Oh, up here? Yeah. So uh, my name is Ben Bravery, and um, I'm a colorectal cancer survivor, bowel cancer survivor. Uh, I'm not gonna spend too much time talking about my story tonight because there'll be opportunities throughout the webinar to come back Next to that. Minute. Thank no, you. I'm just putting the general chat on because we're in the wrong spot. Oh, there thanks. we go. <laughs> thanks. Um, there'll be opportunities in the webinar to come back to that. But just as a quick kind of introduction and overview, I was um, self-employed in Beijing, um, kind of trying to start up a business at the time I got sick. And that was in January 2011. I was diagnosed and had treatment in Melbourne. So I left everything in China settled back in Melbourne, had radiation and chemotherapy, some surgery, had a bunch more chemo, um, had some blood clots in the lungs. And then after a year and a few months, it was kind of March 2012, I, my partner and I kind of looked at each other after this ordeal that is colorectal cancer treatment and said, what on earth do we do now? Like, where do we go and what do we do? And the hospital system had spat us out and we'd felt incredibly well supported um, and nurtured by the hospital system but we were kind of on our own now and left to our own devices. And so I was 29, going on 30, um, had gone through this major event and decided that I would just do what I did before, which is head back to work. So that's what I did. Um, I went back to work with an ileostomy and on blood, um, blood clotting therapy. And um, we, moved, we decided to, that the best opportunities for work for both of us was to move to Sydney, so we did that. And I kind of got swept up in the momentum of moving to a new city and looking for work um, and kind of rushed off and applied for a part-time job because I'd done some thinking that I wanted to stage my re-entry into the workforce. But before I'd even started that job, it was re-offered to me as a full-time job. And so caught up in the momentum, I said yes, like these ducks running along a pond, threw myself into full-time work um, and ended up back in an office. And it was kind of... Once I was there, it, it, after, I guess, you know, a few weeks of settling in and meeting people and finding your rhythm, I was kind of like, why on earth did I do this? <laughs> why did I rush back to work? Why am I sitting in this office? What is happening? Have I changed? How have I changed? And is this the kind of work I want to be doing now? Um, so that's my first point. My first point when going back to work after colorectal cancer is think carefully about the timing of when you go back. Um, and I'm sure that's something we'll hear from the experts about tonight. Um, so you're there, you're in work. Um, I decided to do it and stick at it. And um, let's be honest, um, bowel cancer is, you know, a lot about poo. And, <laughs> and, and as bowel cancer survivors and bowel cancer professionals, we get to talk about poo a lot. Um, and that's no different in the workplace, although poo isn't exactly water cooler chatter. Um, it's not, it's still a little bit taboo and it's not, it's certainly with new colleagues, it's not stories that you'd be launching into, um, whether they know your cancer backstory or not. So, you know, I was kind of confronted by the fact that I needed to go to the bathroom a lot more. Um, that would take me away from my desk. Sometimes I would be late for meetings or 
need to leave early for meetings. Um, I don't know about you guys out there, but post-surgery, my colon is very different than it was before, and it's noisy and has a mind of its own. Um, with the ileostomy, it was exactly the same. The stoma does what it wants when it wants to. And after surgery, it was the same issue. My colon did what it, want, did, did what it wanted when it wanted to. Um, and that was a process of adjustment. Um, also, I guess, kind of apart from the poo stuff, there's all the, the, the mental stuff and the social stuff that happens when you go back to work after cancer. And sometimes I would just be sitting there at my desk in the middle of a project with a deadline you know, going, why? Why am I doing this? If the cancer came back next month, is this how I would want to be spending my time? Would I want to be in this office? Would I be wanting to work on this project? Um, which also meant I got very tired a lot. You know, fatigue is a, a thing survivors will talk about often. Um, and I needed extra support from my team because of that. So I just didn't feel as sharp. I didn't feel as switched on. I needed more time to get my head around things and I needed more downtime, basically. So a lot of mm. tapping pencil on paper. Um, I, I went through a process of reflection, thinking about you know the changes that were happening to my digestive system and what that needed and what that meant, these kind of thoughts that were going in, in my head. And I guess you end up feeling like the odd one out, as I did. I'm the white sheep here. Um, and you feel like you're in this busy environment, which is a workplace, but kind of alone at the same time because especially as a young person with colorectal cancer and, and having gone through the treatment, you feel quite isolated and the situation is quite different from a lot of the, your, your colleagues around you. Um, so before I move on, I, I kind of, all that culminated, I guess, in changing jobs. So I kind of got unhappy with what I was doing, um, changed jobs. Uh, but I hadn't really dealt with the cancer yet, and so I got caught up in momentum again, went back into all the same things, had the same bathroom breaks, the fatigue, the not feeling as sharp, a bit of chemo brain, still feeling like the odd one out, um, and finally pulled myself together, sat down and reflected on what I needed to do in a work environment and decided that I needed to make a big change. And not everybody who goes back to, to work after cancer does that. Some people go back to doing exactly what they were doing before, and that's amazing. And that's exactly what they need. And it gets, puts cancer aside and they're allowed to focus back on the career they had. But I wasn't one of those people. I needed to do something different. Um, and that's what I did. So that's enough of my personal story. I'm sure we'll come back to lots of two stories <laughs> throughout the night, but I'll, I'll hand over. Okay, thanks very much. I might just grab the pen. One of the things I would like to ask is, I know it comes up and I know Naomi's going to talk about it, is you know, having to leave meetings and run to the bathroom how did how did you cope with it it's so awkward yeah <laughs> it's did you um, have to, like a set line you said or something like that or? i think depending on how um obnoxiously loud the interference was um i would either ignore it and if it was a close group of colleagues like my media colleagues i would just they know like they knew about cancer i was open about it um so they knew and we kind of laugh along if it was a larger meeting uh i would just kind of put my head down and get the hell out of the room. <laughs> yeah. um, and in terms of breaks, I was just really open with my management team about that and they were extremely understanding. Yeah, so you, you're lucky. I was very lucky, yeah. very lucky. Good, okay. Thanks, Ben. Hi, Naomi. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll just switch the slides on. I'm Naomi and I'm a stomach therapy nurse and I work out at Nupi and Blue Mountains local health district. Um, I sort of chose this slide because I guess the, the question about getting back into the workforce, you sort of wonder whether you're ready or not, or is this the right timing? And uh, often it's a bit scary. Um, you sort of think to yourself, um, on one hand, I want to go back to work, but on the other hand, I've got this stoma, mm. and um, can the two work together? And I guess the fulcrum really is the aspect of fear. Mm. Um, will I will I get embarrassed? Mm. Will I be found out? Will this secret be known? Will it leak? Will it leak? <laughs> will I have yeah. disasters on my hands? Yeah. Um, and I guess the hardest part with anything like this is trying to get your head around it. You know, what on earth am I doing? And I guess the first step is planning, is, is talking to people like your GP, when is the right time to go back? Um, and I mm. guess everybody's operation is different. And that brings me to the point that, you know, we're focusing in this webinar a little bit about stomas and um, 
having bowel cancer and not everybody has to go through this journey. Mm. Other people might have bowel cancer and that's all taken removed and this and it, they can be joined up. But some people, due to the location of the cancer, they will need to have a stoma. So the question is, how do I get back into the workforce? So one of the big things is to plan. Um, talk to your yeah, talk to your doctor, talk to your manager. You know, maybe you can gradually ease back into the workforce. Maybe you can go on lighter duties or part time or reduce workload. The idea is to get into a routine, and you want to be able to get up in the morning. You know, you you, you brush your hair, you do your teeth, you look after your pouch. Um, and you might need to do a few, uh, I suppose, trial runs. Um, first of all, you might, you know, like even getting out of the house after the operation, you sort of think, oh, you know, mm. c can I actually um, go across and visit my friends? <laughs> Will I be okay? You mm. might, you know, uh, you might need to go to the shopping centre, buy a few groceries, come back, oh, that was safe, I, I managed, I survived. Um, then you might need to do a day's trip and go out um, and see how you go, see whether you can manage the toilets outside and find some place where you can manage this. Uh, so those are a few things just to, to keep in mind. Now, a stoma. I mean, we've talked a lot about a stoma. And what is a stoma? Um, a stoma in the Greek language actually means mouth. And what they do, it's they, they bring the bowel. So the bowel goes from your mouth all the way down to your bottom and it's made out of mucous membrane. So it's soft, pink and moist. So it just looks like the inside of your mouth. Um, when they bring the bowel out, they bring it through the abdominal wall and they turn it over like a cup of a sleeve. So that becomes your stoma. Sometimes they are formed so that they stick out a little bit. Sometimes they're sort of just more or less flush with the tummy. Uh, they come in all different shapes and sizes, roughly around about two to four centimetres, depending on what type of stoma it is. Um, on top of the stoma, you'll have the, uh, the pouch. And I'll just see if I can bring up the pointer. So with the pouch. And the pouches are meant to just adhere uh, well to your, to your tummy um, without any odours or without any smells or anything like that and underneath your clothes. You've got to click the little red dot. Okay, now I'll just move this one out. Sorry, the wrong, wrong one. Is that right? Mm. Yeah. Um, so there are different types of stomas. I mean, you sort of mentioned you had an ileostomy. Mm. Yep. And an ileostomy, yeah, keep going. Ileostomy relates to the small bowel. So from your mouth down through the stomach into the small intestine. The last part of the small intestine is the ileum. So when the ileum is brought out to the skin, you get an ileostomy. When you have the another type of stoma is a colostomy. So that comes into the colon, which is a large bowel. Yeah, that's great. Right. Oh, thanks yeah. for that. Yeah. So there's a large bowel here. So it goes up, across, down and out. So an operation where the colon is involved and that's brought out to the skin, you get a colostomy. I should also mention too that people also can have bladder cancer as well. And with bladder cancer, you actually they use a part of the ileum, so the small bowel. Um, they bring out a part of that small uh, bowel, um, just a small piece there. They sewed up one end, the other end comes through the abdominal wall and the ureters from the kidneys get inserted into that piece here. So that the urine when it's made comes into the ileal conduit, that's another name for ureostomy. Um, and then comes out into a bag. And they rejoin the bowel so the plumbing still works. Uh, stomas can be temporary and they also they can be permanent. Um, okay, I'll just move on to the next slide. <laughs> I've got here, there are different types of stoma characters. Sometimes stomas, as you might know, they have a mind of their own. They'll work when they want to work. Um, and that can be really frustrating because we like to be in control, we like to be in charge. Um, some people find that, uh, you know, when they, they work, they, they, they like to think of it sometimes as a name. I don't know if you ever called your stoma a name. I didn't or not. name it, but <laughs> <laughs> I can never do. bring myself to it, but it's exceptionally common. It is. It's really right. common to name so This is George, this is Gertrude. Yeah. Sally, you know, Sally, the same is very common. <laughs> <laughs> so, so they have characters, and when they work, I often talk about them being chatty, because sometimes you just want them to shut up. <laughs> so I've got here, this is a noisy stoma, so it often wants to talk and it's very active. This one here is a bit of a bashful sort of stoma. Um, you know, it's sort of quiet, it does its own thing, it's no trouble. This one here I call a bipolar stoma. <laughs> it's, it's like it's got a personality problem and uh, one minute it's very good, next minute it's a dreadful one. And this one here I've picked as being a bit like the assassin, the one that's out to cause problems. 
And I'd like to say to you that if you have one of these characters, please see your stomach therapist because we need to get those characters under control. All right. Now, looking at Tom, some of the issues about going back to work. I've got here a few things like disclosure. Will my stomach get damaged? What to do about toilet breaks? What to do about leakage, clothes, smell, gas, noise? Okay, with disclosure. Um, it really does depend on your relationships. Like mm -hmm. you seem like you had a fairly good uh, network of people that you could actually talk to, a small group. Mm -hmm. um, and it just very de much depends on your situation. Some people choose to be really upfront and tell people. Other people sort of more or less say that, um, oh, I just want to keep it close to my chest. It's a good idea possibly just to tell one person so that if you have to attend to Sally, <laughs> you can just sort of give that bit of a code and say, this, I'm just ducking out, you know, Sally's caused me a bit of a problem. Uh, there's the issue of that damage. And with your workplace, if you're in a situation where your um, stone is likely to be damaged, you might be in the building industry, you might be... Um, in an area where you're concerned about your stoma, you can actually get uh, so stones like a guard that goes over the top of it. Um, it's a hard plastic and you can strap it there mm. so that if you are underneath a car and you're concerned about it being rubbed, then you can, you've got some sort of protection. Um, I did hear one story of about a person who was in an office situation and when she was at the desk, um, it was right the same position as her stoma itself. So she, what she actually did was mm. that she got like a, uh, a noodle, the pool noodle. She cut it in half and put it across the side here so that she wouldn't actually hurt or damage it. Driving can be a bit of an issue and um, sometimes the seatbelt is right across where the stoma is. So you can get the accessories from the car accessory place and get like those sheepskin covers or you can put a little pillow there or a, a cushion of some kind and that can actually help that. I think that's a really good point, Naomi, because you spend a lot of time with your stoma before yeah. you go back to work. Yeah. Yeah. And like I, I worked in offices and right. I never sat all day with my stoma and the bag and it was a totally different experience. Yes. I yes. really had to adapt to the bag, yes. the types of adhesives I used and everything. Yes, you really have to. And I think we're very creative and I think that when you get back into the workplace, you'll be thinking to myself, oh gosh, how am I going to address this? How am I going to work that out? Right. Um. Okay, there's a few slides here. This particular symbol, um, the first one of the chap on the toilet, is more or less addressing, well, how do I change my bag when I'm out and about? And if you've got a urostomy, or otherwise known as a little conduit, where you've got urine, then you'll be going to the toilet when there's a third full, um, <clears throat> and you'll, you know, probably often will empty that just before meals. Same with uh, an ileostomy, you know, before meals. We often teach that, you know, check it before meals. Is as soon as you sit down, you want to make certain that there's nothing in the bag when you have your meal. Um, if you've got a colostomy, then you often will have, you, you'll have a, what they call a well-formed poo, and uh, it's a matter of trying to take that off and find a place where do I put my bag. Uh, and that can be a, a bit tricky. Like for us women, we have the sanitary disposal units that we can put the bin in, but for guys, it's a bit difficult. Really good point. Yeah. <laughs> so it's it's a bit of an issue, and that's one thing that if you're you're going back to your workplace, maybe you can talk to your boss or your manager and just say, listen, can we get a sanitary bin for one of the toilets here? Or you can go to the disabled toilets. It's a very popular place. Yep. Um, you know, find a disabled toilet. I did hear one really interesting story, and the story came from England where there was a guy who had bowel cancer, had a colostomy, and he was in a situation where he couldn't find um, a place to... How could he go to the toilet, change his bag, take the old bag and put it in the bin? So <laughs> what I heard he did was he'd get um, a new bag, a, um, what you call it, a nappy sack, one of those thin freezer bags or that sort of thing, and a piece of foil. So what he'd actually do is he'd go to the toilet, he'd actually change his bag, with the old one, he'd put that into the nappy sack and tie it. Then he'd get the foil and he'd fold it like it was a pair of sand like some sandwiches. Mm. <laughs> so, to disguise it. To it. <laughs> so, so then he'd go out from there and then he'd chuck it in the bin and yeah. he was on his way. Very clever. But, um, so there are a few think, different things you can do. Another thing that, um, uh, we, that they'd look at is if you had... Um, uh, if you had a, a closed pouch and you're going to somewhere fancy like uh, the Opera House or a place like that, and you didn't, you were a bit nervous about the situation, then they'd actually, um, sometimes people would actually wear a drainable bag, mm. so that if it's a well-formed motion, what they'd actually do is move it through, push it down, and then they'd be able to pop it out. Um, okay, 
Now this one here, this, the next, the middle slide, is looking at the timekeeper, and that's that question about what do you do when you're, you've got to tend to your bag and you're in a meeting. So you're a little bit concerned, a little bit stressed about that sort of situation. And it is very hard. Like um, if you're at a checkout and you've got to tend to your bag, just trying to leave when you've got lots of people in the queue, mm. that's going to be a difficult one. Mm. Um, whereas in other situations, you might be able to move about and go and um, change your bag without a problem. There's a question about... Um, how often do you change your bag? We would normally say four to six times is, is fine. However, some people will have times where they seem to be having to empty it all the time. If you have to empty it a, a real lot and you'd have to be more than four to six times and you think that the volume is over a litre, then that's a question for the doctors. Mm. Um, because you can get really tired, you can lose a lot of electrolytes, so you need to be careful. Things like radiotherapy and chemotherapy are things that can also affect how often you go, because it sort of irritates the bowel. Um, but, but there are other things that you need to be mindful too, like um, caffeine, um, coffee, uh, tea, um, those energy drinks, chocolate will yeah. also help. Sugary things. Sugary things. Sugary things. Even, the, even those, um, uh, those sort of calorie-free drinks that have got like sorbitol or yeah, that sort sure. of things, that they can also make you go to the toilet a lot. Yeah. So you've got to be careful of those. Um, also foods, you know, like if you have a lot of spicy foods, um, curries, a lot of fruit and veggies, that sort of thing, that can also mean that it's going to be very active. So it's probably good to be careful there. Um, my notes. Um, okay. What to do about leaks? Well, I'd like to think nobody has leaks, but to be honest, you've got to be realistic that that can happen. So always take things with you. I'd, I'd always have, you know, would you take things with you wherever you went? or you Yeah, I, I never, but I had a particularly trouble, I had a particularly troubling time trying to adapt. Yeah. So my, my digestive system took a long time, but okay. then I struggled with the type of bag I was using. Oh, yes. And I leaked all over the place all the time. I know that's awful for a thermal therapist to hear. <laughs> I don't want to hear that. <laughs> no. um, and I, I had a kit, yes. and I, I, it was never out of sight. That's right. Yeah. I'm quite surprised that some people would have come and they would never bring anything with them. Um, well, that strikes fear into me, <laughs> even now, thinking about that. That's right. So, and people would either carry them with them, so in their bag. Um, other people might actually take some in their car. You always be very careful if it's in the car because the heat can mm. impact on the adhesive. So if you haven't got a little esky, then that's a good thing. And circulate your stock would be mm. a good thing to do. Okay, and what will I wear? Well, this the, the character with the, the hats, I guess it's really still symbolising, it's a very personal thing, trying to try what, what you think will work. I can remember once I went to Concord Hospital and I knew there was a lady there who had a stoma and she came to speak to another patient. And she didn't know who I was, but I could see her at the lifts. And I thought to myself, where's the bag? Because she wore tight-fitting clothes, mm. she looked like a model. And I thought, oh, gosh, she's really hidden it really well. And what she did with her bag was that she could actually have, she had an ileostomy and she actually had a bag so it went across her tummy. Oh, that's clever. Yeah, so <laughs> as it filled up, it just looked like a bit of a tum, and then when she went to the toilet, she'd turn it down and, and let it run oh, out. Clever. So there are ways and means of doing it. Um, what other things? You, there's another thing you can do, and this is for a patient who's had an operation where they've got a colostomy, so it's in the large bowel, and they might have a motion maybe once a day or once every couple of days. You can do a thing called irrigation, and that's where you take control of the stoma. So the control, the stoma's not controlling you, you're controlling it. So you can actually train your bowel when to work, and you'd actually um, go through a process of training, and then eventually what should actually happen is that for two days your bowel won't work. So it won't make gassy noises or you don't have to be concerned about um, noises and things like that. So irrigation is something that if that's of interest to you, talk that to your stomach therapist. Um, there are lots of things on the market that can uh, disguise the contours of your, of your pouch. Um, I know one gentleman who um, says to me that what he does to try and lessen his contours is he gets his mother to go into Big W and get boob tubes if he finds that they go across your tummy quite well. <laughs> I did yeah. the same thing. Oh, did you? Oh, but, but, no, yeah, but, but I got mum to go buy maternity belts. 
Oh, okay. Yeah, so I wore little maternity belts. They're about that wide and okay. kind of elastic. Yeah, yeah, Same yeah. Same thing. Yeah, yeah. But mum had to go do it. Okay. <laughs> I wasn't going into it. And there's it. another thing you could do. There's actually stockings. If you cut off the legs of oh, stockings, yeah. you can actually yeah, use that, that part around there. Yeah. There are also mm. things on the market that you can get through the associations that will also flatten out those contours too. So the stoma therapist will help you with that. Um, if you wear clothes that have a bit of a pattern or a design, that sometimes take away from, you know, con you know what could look like a bag underneath, so designs can help. Some people find that they have a elasticised waist is a good thing, or a skirt, elasticised um, skirt or pants. If it's a guy and it's rubbing on the stoma, sometimes they wear braces. Uh, some people like to wear sort of like an overshirt, like layering, um, so that it takes away from that feel that you've got something there. If you're wearing a really tailored outfit, what what patients say to me is that they like to go up a size, so that sometimes is, is helpful. Uh, and other than that, trying to keep the pouch relatively empty. Some of the things to just a few tips and pointers to keep in mind. Okay, what should I do about smell and gas? Um, and the next slide is all about noise. Um, so I, I remember I was told once that with the stoma, it really is the way they look at it is it's just a, a bottom in another location. And they say that when they tend to their stoma, well, at least they can see what they're doing, whereas we can't. <laughs> <laughs> and if they pass wind, they're okay because they've got a filter. Yeah. Whereas we can clear a room, you know. So, <laughs> so they talk about the advantages of having a stoma. So true. <laughs> um, but there are a few things. So, and, and I guess because the stoma is right underneath your nose and you're more aware of it, uh, but there are a few things, a few tricks that um, patients have told me. Things like uh, eucalyptus oil, um, Tic Tacs, a couple of Tic Tacs um, is helpful. Tea tree oil, uh, I think I said eucalyptus. So what do they do with the Tic Tacs though? They put a couple of those in the pouch and that seems oh, to really? make it, yeah. Wow, okay, yeah, that's excellent. That yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. Um, people say also marshmallows makes it a little bit of a sweeter smell too. <laughs> and then of course there's the air freshener that you can use. <laughs> um, Helpful things that you can use. Now, uh, probiotics is a good thing. Um, going to a chemist, they have lots of little things that you can use, but probiotics is good. Yogurt is good. Um, there are some teas they talk about, like there's, um, uh, what's the name of it? Um, ginger tea, ginger tea, peppermint tea, fennel tea. Not that I've tried fennel tea, but those are some things that they talk about as being good. Uh, you can get enzymes that can also help break down some of the foods that into more simpler um, sugars that will also help and you can get those as a dietary supplement. Um, there are products from the association that you can put in the bag as well. There's some mm. you know, different potions and lotions that you can use. Um, there's uh, anti-flatulence tablets, there's charcoal tablets, so there's a few different things that you can use that to help with the smell and with the gas. Looking at what you eat, now there's quite a number of things. I mean we all do produce gas, so that's a normal thing that happens. Um, but there are certainly foods, and we probably already know them, that if you go and have a meal of baked beans, then obviously you're going to have a lot of issues. So, But there are things like beans, broccoli, cauliflower, leeks, onions, garlic, all those yummy things. Um, uh, also dairy products and flour, um, pasta, those sort of things will also produce a lot of gas. So if you're going to an important meeting, probably not having a high load of carbohydrates like that Fry might mm. be a good idea to try and avoid those. Um, drinks like fizzy drinks, they'll produce a lot of gas. So be careful of fizzy drinks. Some people, if they do want to have a fizzy drink and they're out with their friends, they'll actually let the bubble sort of escape for a while, for around about 10 minutes before they'll actually have it. Okay, I think just to make sure I've covered things. Um, okay, what the. Uh, be careful when you actually have your meal, because we can actually swallow a lot of gas. Um, so it's probably good just to chew your food slowly um, and chew it well. Um, sometimes by having small frequent meals, that can also be helpful, uh, so not to rush. And also be careful with using straws, because we're actually swallowing gas as well. Okay, noisy stomas. Um, and again, depending on your workplace, so if you're in a really quiet room, 
and you some some people get the sensation that you are actually going to be passing wind, so they'll sort of get their arm and sort of try and muffle the sound. Did you ever get a sensation that you were passing wind? No or, warning. No warning at all. <laughs> no warning. <laughs> <laughs> no, I guess maybe there's a difference between the ileostomy and colostomy yeah. as to yeah. um, whether you can actually hide it at all. And it is also embarrassing if it is very quiet. There's also that sort of thing where you can sort of behind you, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> the dog did it. So there are a few things that you sort of maybe as little sayings or things that you can think about when it does actually happen. Coughing, um, you know, moving back in your chair if it's a sort of a hard mm. floor makes a bit of a sound, um, trying to disguise it. Some people talk about uh, trying to um, lessen the sound. You can get, um, I know in America there's a belt called a stealth belt and that actually sort of uh, dampens down some of the sounds. Mm. Some people say, I really like to wear maternity pants because it's a bit thicker material and it sort of muffles the sound a little bit more. Um, so there are things like that that they try to do to try and lessen it. Um, I did have one patient who actually came to see me because specifically they said, I've got a really noisy stoma. And sure enough, he was sitting in the clinic and he was just chatting away. He was just very excited. <laughs> and um, what I actually found out was that his stoma was very chatty because it was very active. And he was actually losing three to four litres a day wow. out of his stoma. And that's the reason why I was chatty. So don't ever assume you should, that you know it's okay. Maybe you need to see your doctor and see someone about it. Um, there's a topic there that says toilet noises. Well... I know that sometimes, I don't know, when you go to the bathroom, when you undo your bag, if it's an ileostomy, sometimes that, that gush can be a bit, oh dear, you know, I wonder what other people think. You can put toilet paper in the bowl and or as it runs out so that it sort of doesn't sort of flush out so quickly. Mm. Um, that's one thing you can do. I know one lady said to me that when she emptied her pouch, she would actually, there's a sanitary bin beside her, she's didn't really... It just she wanted to disguise it, so she'd open up the lid, then let it go, <laughs> <laughs> then close the lid, just to try and you know take away that sort of um, focus as to what is that noise. Um, and I probably would like to sort of end on with one little story, and because it is um, and going back to the first line, you know, the fear about going back to work. Um, I had um, a patient who just had his operation. His wife actually had the same operation about ten years earlier. And she came to him and she said, darling, she said, because she's nervous, she's a bit worried about how he's going to accept this donor. And her words I've never forgotten because they were really, really significant. And she said, darling, I want you to see this doma as your friend because your friend has given you life. Mm. So it was a really significant thing about keeping things in focus. That this is, this is because you want to live. And so it's a matter of dealing with this and all things are possible. So... Let's go to the next slide. There are lots of places that you can go for help. If you do have problems, you know, I, th I think we stomas are, are, I call ourselves um, a bit like frustrated plumbers. We don't like leaks. We want to fix things. So if you have a problem, you know, occasionally it might happen. But if it, if it happens over a number of times, please see your stomach therapist. Go back. The associations will also have a stomach therapist there. You can contact the website. Major hospitals have a stomach therapist. You can see your GP. Mm. So don't put up with it. That's mm. right. Don't put up with it. So there was um, someone. One of the questions that came in was someone for. You would have read the question for seven years. They've been putting up with problems, uh, uh, and it's like you. Well, you yeah. don't have to put and, up with and it. So, and I yeah. do hear that. And I honestly feel we can get a solution. If they're committed to finding a solution, we're committed to working with them. Yeah. And we do yeah. hear stories like that. I remember I had one lady who said. I'm tired of waking up in bed and I've had a leak. Mm. And, uh, but we were able to fix them and, and the, the giving them their life back by saying that they can get back into their life again makes a huge difference. And do you think it's sometimes people just think, well, look, this is the way it is and I've got oh, to accept do. it? And they do. Yeah. They do. And so I really would like to say don't. Don't accept skin problems. Don't accept leaks. Contact your stomach therapist. Get the matter resolved. Advice. And then you can reclaim your life and get back to what you want to do. Thanks, Naomi. Sorry. Now we're going to hand over to Catherine. Thanks for the touch. And gosh, I learned a lot. <laughs> yeah, thank you ever so much. <laughs> thank you ever so much. 
and move the mouse along. I work as a clinical um, psychologist in cancer care, and um, so I'm going to be talking more about the emotional side of things. Um, I guess a lot of you watching and listening were really relating to many of the things that Ben was saying. Um, so, so there are a lot of common experiences, a, a lot of common responses, but there's also everyone will have their own story and their unique experiences. Um, how you adjust and your response will obviously affect how you go back to work and um, your work the little arrow. And your work situation is obviously going to affect your emotional um, response as well. So Cancer is obviously a significant life event. Bowel cancer is a significant life event. So the sorts of responses that, that we would expect, uh, an impact on mood, on depression, this can ov obviously affect your energy levels, your motivation, your, your ability to experience joy. Of course, if you're experiencing fatigue from treatment, this can also um, impact your mood if you're not able to do the things that normally um, give you pleasure or you're not able to live your life in the normal way. Anxiety and worry is, is very, very common. This, um, this, this might be about fears of the cancer. It might be um, about um, worry about your future health, lack of confidence in your health. Um, I guess if we're thinking about the impact in the work environment, it might be changes to your appearance, as we've heard, um, ch changes to um, um, bowel functioning um, that, that can really add a whole load of new um, anxiety and worry. Ben, ben also touched on this, just feeling very different, um, feel maybe um, identifying changes in your values and your priorities. I often pe hear people mention, as you, as you did, that they might be in a particularly dull meeting and they might be thinking, <laughs> looking out the window at a beautiful Sydney day, thinking, what on earth am I doing here? Hold on. Um, yeah. <laughs> Hold on. You know, um, you know, sometimes um, people with young children, you know, the decision to go back to work might have been hard anyway. This really just compounds, compounds that, those sorts of dilemmas. So if we think about those emotional responses, they can impact your ability to get back to work. Obviously, if you're starting the day, having had a pretty shocking night's sleep, you're really only starting with a little bit in your tank. Obviously, the impact on your relationships and social interaction. Sometimes people find it particularly hard if they haven't heard from their colleagues while they've been on leave, and so that transition back to work um, can be really quite um, difficult. It might be disappointment about some of the support that um, didn't um, wasn't it didn't um, come for them during their time. Obviously, self-confidence, body image, we've, we've, um, we've heard about impact on cognitive functioning. If you're not sleeping well, if you're suffering from um, anxiety, it's, it's really hard to think clearly, even to string a sentence together sometimes and perform in, in the way. So both your intellectual and your physical performance can be affected. And obviously, because everyone's work situation is unique, you might be self-employed or you might be in a big corporate, may have... You know, you might be doing more manual work. Um, this, you know, the, I guess the unique challenges from your treatment um, will, will have unique impacts on you. So the emotions can obviously affect um, your performance at work. We also know um, everyone's treatment is different. Even people that have the same treatment will respond in different ways. They will have different side effects. Obviously, more treatments, it, it's probably going to be tougher. And I think it's really important to note at this time, try not to compare yourself to other people. Mm -hmm. We often hear people, they've, they've been to radiotherapy and, and someone's told them the story about how they pop down in their lunchtime and, you know, mm -hmm. they're, they're doing very well. And, and the other person might be saying, gosh, I'm just about managing to get out of bed and get showered each day. So I, I think it's a bit like childbirth stories. Comparisons aren't normally helpful. Um, obviously, differences in pain levels, fatigue level. This obviously, um, you know, depends where you are along your treatment continuum. Whether you finish treatment, um, ch changes in appearance is, is um, can be quite difficult. We've probably touched on um, treatment itself um, um, can affect, can cause cognitive changes. But people talk about um, chemo brain the whole time. So we've got the double whammy of the emotional responses causing that, as well as the treatment effects. Is. Um, for some people, you know, planning um, how you're going to manage work is really important, but there might be great uncertainty about what treatment's going to look like. Um, the doctors may need more scans or more tests before they decide on what the next um, lot of intervention might look like. 
so all, all of those factors can have an impact. Obviously the workplace, your work situation has an impact, what the demands are, what sort of flexibility um, there may be or there may not be. Um, you know, the difference, you know, if someone's a, a classroom teacher, um, what's up, as, as we're saying, if they're working on, on the checkout, there might not always be the opportunity to, to, to duck out to the bathroom. Um, for, for a lot of people, um, how their work was managed while they're away was in, would be important. Um, there's someone I've, I've, um, I've spoken to who, um, while she's been on leave, the whole computer systems have changed. Staff have changed. She was in a managerial role. Huge anxiety about how she's going to function. But, you know, did the person who was seconded to do her position while she was away, did they actually do a better job and how, how, she, how she's going to manage, how are her colleagues going to um, uh, respond to her? And that's something we're going to talk about um, a bit more later. Obviously, colleagues' personal experiences, their understanding of cancer is um, very important and the level of support um, in, in, in the workplace will be very different for different people. And I'm sure there's many people listening that have had really positive experiences and other people that have had really real challenges with trying to reintegrate um, back into work. So because everyone's experience is different, I thought it might be helpful to review a sort of a problem-solving um, strategy um, so, so that this can be applied to whatever the unique concerns might be for you at different points. So this is very simply trying to identify what are you most worried about, what possible options are there that can help. So just completely brainstorming this, maybe talking to um, peer, um, peer support people through the Cancer Council, maybe speaking to friends, um, trying to work out, come up with a whole range of different options. We then evaluate these options, choose one, implement it. Um, if it works, give ourselves a pat on the back. If it doesn't, we go back, we try another, we get some more support. So we're going to use that, um, that strategy to look at a couple of um, common concerns. So the first one, which, um, which, which people talk about generally in their social world, is dealing with the things people say. Um, sometimes these are very well-meaning, but sometimes they're not received particularly well. And that can be really hard if we're thinking about it might be the transition back to work or it might be um, an o an o on an ongoing basis. So I'm sure people who are looking at this screen can prob could probably relate to many of these. I'm sure people could probably add quite a, a few as well. Um, sometimes even the relatively benign comments such as how was your weekend might be quite challenging to answer for someone that might be in the middle of treatment, might have spent it between their bed and the bathroom or, um, and they're not wanting to sort of <laughs> be doom and gloom every Monday morning but they need to actually work out what's, what's, what's an appropriate way of responding to this so that people don't sort of stop answering um, or, or run a mile when, when they see them. So. So let's have a look at that. So common, common worries, the invasive questions, awkwardness, people avoiding me. Um, so what options do we have? Um, Ben's talked about a, a few options. Um, I'll just run through a, a few. Some people, um, as Naomi said, they might be quite private and, and might just want to um, deal, deal with concerns as they arise. But often helpful to think about limited information and, and who to share that with. Um, ben gave some great examples of actually taking control and addressing it up, uh, addressing um, it up front. Have phrases ready and rehearse standard responses. And you can use the same ones again and again. You don't need to come up with anything clever and new e each time. Um, there might be risky people or risky situations that you need to plan for. It might be that management or email, there's other, the office gossip might be a, a good way of trying to um, get messages across. Um, if, if we're aware that we might experience anxiety or panic symptoms, having some strategies to calm ourselves so that we can, we can um, d deliver, um, deliver um, the words or the phrases we want to. And as Ben's um, obviously shown us, humour, black humour, <laughs> <laughs> can work really well. Um, getting support, um, guiding the colleagues. Um, a, a lot of colleagues just don't know what to say and do. It, it's like often with other... Um, other crises in, in life. So guiding them um, about, you know, how, what sort of level of questions appropriate or how, how they might respond to you. And there's some great resources from the Cancer Council um, actually on, on suggestions for coll um, colleagues. So, so thinking about educate them. So again, choose an option, um, implement one, see if it works. If it doesn't, um, we rethink. 
the, the next um, example we're going to go through is dealing with fatigue and this is something most people will experience. It may be um, acute during treatment or it may be um, longer term for, for many people. Um, the strategy would, would be appropriate um, if, if we're also looking at um, dealing with um, peripheral neuropathy um, or, or bowel changes. Um, often the thoughts are, you know, do I have the mental, the physical capacity to do my job well? Pe people are obviously often really um, keen to, and conscientious to do a good job. So options again, and um, we've heard already about when to return to work, and, and that, that message again of please do not go back too soon. Very paced, it, it's much easier to increase than to decrease at a later point. Mm. I would always encourage people as well to have the holiday before they go back because if you're back for one month and then you put in a leave form or you ask for leave, um, people have said to me, the colleagues said, oh, well, you've just had six months off or you've just had a year off as if you've been on, you know, been doing day, something yeah. fun. Um, so really trying to make sure that you're in the best possible um, place. Um, so uh, thinking about your time management, um, when, you, when you might be able to get the best work done, if there's flexibility in, in your workplace for doing that. Um, you know, uh, what, what's sort of reasonable as, as far as adjustment. Obviously, how you look after yourself outside of work has a big impact on, on how you turn up each day. So taking care of sleep, diet, exercise, general stress management, um, um, get, getting support for, from management. They, if, if, if you don't tell them, they, they can't have the opportunity to, um, to offer help. Maybe also just having a, a look at your expectations of yourself. Um, if, we, if we think about what and have a look at what your goals are, um, I, I guess it sometimes relates to what hap has happened to your work while you've been away. For some people, it would have just piled up on the desk. If we think about someone who's maybe a project manager or an academic, the, the research grants may not have get writ, writ, written while, while they're away and it can be really hard to try and balance your sort of hopes and dreams of what you want from work versus the reality of what you're capable at, at, of doing. And I can think of someone like, uh, that I saw that, that sort of described going back to work absolutely exhausted, literally sitting in front of the computer all day doing nothing, brains not firing, noticing I'm doing nothing, I'm achieving something, then obviously thinking, you know, how am I ever going to get this work done as her mood just spiralled down. So we need to be really realistic with ourselves and also um, help others understand um, our capacity as well. Obviously, um, there might be um, specialists um, that can help with advice in that area. Again, evaluate, choose uh, and then review. Um, stress and work is a big topic. <laughs> um, people are of, often concerned if they've um, been working in a stressful environment, will it bring my cancer back? They're concerned about if day-to-day -day life was a struggle in itself, then um, you know, adding work into the equation, um, how, how are they going to manage that? As far as stress and cancer, getting accurate information from your doctors and the cancer council can be very helpful. As far as managing stress at work, it's the same sort of stress management um, skills we would think of generally, trying to problem solve in what is the source of the stress um, and what can I do differently. Are there stress management skills I could use? Are there things that I might have learned through um, my, you know, my cancer journey, relaxation skills, breathing skills, mindfulness skills um, to manage those times? What about other stresses? What's worked in the past and can we use those skills now? Support, this might be informal social contact, peer support, it might be management, or it might be um, talking to a professional um, outside of the work environment. Good self-care, again, always very important um, with, with stress management. And it, and it might be that you um, even see the return to work as a bit of an experiment. See how it works for you, try different strategies. It might be that you need to go back and review your options, review your values, review your choices. Um, if, if you are having struggles um, with work, just going back to that advice about recording your hours, recording your, um, your discussions and, and keeping correspondence um, is, is helpful. So evalu evaluate the options, choose one, implement. So if we think about um, the, the emotional, um, the, the impact of emotions at work, we're, we're just going back to thinking about stress, let me just 
top there, we might find one of the responses um, that we have is difficulty actually dealing with our emotions at work. There might be things people say or things that happen um, that upset us. We might find we're more t um, teary. We might find we're more irritable. Um, so we need, again, we need a plan just like we, we have with the same. We need to plan, we need to prepare and we need to plan. So professional support might be helpful here. If your emotional adjustment is affecting your performance at work, if you're feeling you're not coping, others are noticing this, if you're feeling always worried about work, always worrying, stressed, not sleeping, not able to enjoy things or think that you might be depressed or alternatively work's affecting your emotional well-being. If you're having physical symptoms that aren't related to health such as if you're starting to experience panic, avoid, avoiding things or you just want to reassess decisions in your life. Um, seeing a health professional can be very helpful um, as far as getting some input um, to, to try and... Because um, that's what you did then. You reassessed. Yeah, in a major way. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I. Um, yeah. But it took a couple of turns, a couple of different jobs. I thought the job was the problem. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't. It was just going back too soon. And it's funny you say that because when I I was 15 months out of work, and and people uh, to the treatment and people were like, but you've you've had 15 months off, aren't you ready? Yeah. yeah. And you go, it's not a holiday. <laughs> 21. <laughs> You try really hard not to. It's like, it's not a holiday. No. And, and you're right, you need a holiday mm. after all of that. Mm. It's interesting. Mm. One of the things that I sort of talk about with patients is that it's a full-time job being sick. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, we all agree. Yeah. Full-time job. <laughs> you know, all the appointments, all the doctors, all the specialists, yeah. uh, just getting out of the bed, trying to manage, working out what on earth this mm. is for my tummy. It's, it's a lot. It takes a lot of time. And mm. also things go out of your mind, you know, like you sort of have these points, oh, I forgot about that one, or, you know, it's exhausting. It's managing, and, you know, we, we did a return to work webinar last year, which Ben was on, and he wrote a CV, and part of that CV and his experience was all the managing, and so it's some of the skills of managing yourself during yeah. that time. Yeah. And the so, thing is, it's probably one of the hardest times in your life to actually be learning new skills and, and learning to jug, juggle new things mm -hmm. as well. So, yeah. So there's the summary up there. Yes. If you want to run through it quickly, yes, Catherine. So just, so, um, the take-home message is a range of emotional responses are to be expected um, after bowel cancer and also when returning to work. There may be challenges. Problem solve these. Give it time. Notice your achievements. And that if things aren't working, lots of avenues for advice and support. And I know Jill's going to talk about the Cancer Council. Yeah. Do you want to throw the mic over here? And I'll... Yeah. Um, so I think, and, and I think also as you're watching this tonight and watching the PowerPoint, um, because it's going to be recorded, you'll be able to go back and look over those slides again. So don't feel like, oh, I haven't, I've missed something and I want to review what Catherine was talking about and Naomi and Ben, of course. Ben's lovely pictures. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, you can go back and review all that. So we're going to move on now. We've got a few questions that came up when people were registering. And we've kind of covered this, but maybe there might be more to discuss, I think. So I'll read the question out. So how do I manage to go to the toilet urgently when I'm in an office situation? And there was another, the same about this urgency, primary school teaching environment. So you get a room full of kids. That would be rather tricky, I think. Meetings or lunches. So I, this is kind of a Naomi, mm, or sure, maybe something sure, Ben's sure. experience where you've got to rush out. It's, yeah, and, and I guess that is a hard one, and, and I'd really ask them to sort of think a bit more about their diet situation, uh, what sort of foods are they eating, uh, what sort of liquids they're drinking, what things that might make it to be really a lot more active. Yeah. So it's just that management. Yes, it is. And trying to understand how their body reacts and copes with that and yeah. also making certain too that um, if it's been really, really active, maybe that's something they need to see their GP about as well. Yeah. Or their stomach therapist. Yeah, or their stomach yeah. therapist, that's right. Um, I, sorry. One, one yeah. of the questions came up, Muhammad was saying mm. earlier, was is, if I'm travelling or having meetings, is there um, something I can take? There and, are things yeah. that you can, if it's really watery, there is things that you can actually put in your bag that make it a lot thicker so it's not so sloshy and moving around mm. as well. Um, and there are medications that can slow it down. There's... Um, the things so that again, GP. GP that can give that can slow it down as well. So the advice would be go to GP. your GP. Yeah. Okay. I think in so, fact it's yeah. entirely normal to use those medications for a couple of years. So I used them while I had the stoma, and then after the stoma, there's a whole new set of things to adapt to. Um, and it was quite it was, my GP was, was quite normal to be taking some of that medication off and on 
as needed for a couple of years after okay. surgery. Okay. So, second question. Management of diet after loss of rectum and part of the descending colon. So, okay. I guess we've kind of covered that really. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and, and I should just mention that um, the diet issue for an ileostomy and a colostomy are different. Mm, very different. Okay. So with an, an ileostomy, that's a small bowel, you've got to be very careful, especially just after the operation, that that fibre doesn't cause a blockage. So after around about six, eight weeks, your small bowel should be back to normal and you should be able to consume anything like anybody else. With a large bowel, you never really have that dietary problem. Um, you can start from day one to have anything. However, you probably be more aware of the effect of foods about, um, you know, like if you have a lot of the carbohydrates, you know, the bread, rice, pasta, bananas, the potatoes, it's going to make it more thicker. Um, if you have more of the fibrous foods, you'll make it a bit more waterier. So just being, you'll be aware of the impact of food. Mm. But it's a learning process. It is. By the sound of it, yeah. Now the last question is from a health professional. Um, I can't remember exactly what field they were in, but so how can I provide services for clients in order to prepare them for returning to work with regards to stoma bags, fatigue, coping with inquiries about their health. Kind of everything we talked about really, <laughs> isn't it? So we really, I guess we've really answered that question, unless you've got anything else you want to add. No, I think it's all, about, you know, that planning preparing. and planning and just trialling, seeing what works. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, just um, for people to be confident that in, in having some of those responses prepared, and they don't owe anyone an explanation. They don't have to give any information that they don't feel comfortable. Sometimes people find it particularly hard if, if they've sort of given a little bit of information and then it's followed by a very invasive question, how to actually pull, pull back a, a bit. So, mm -hmm. again, having some phrases um, to manage. Yeah. Uh, just on one topic about the fatigue side of things, um, you sort of mentioned that you, you're also very tired, mm. and I think we need to be kind to ourselves. Mm. You know, and when you go through that experience, and if you're going back to work, think about when you return home. If you've got to have to cook a meal, is there some things that you can do that make it simpler and easier? You know, can you lie down? What sort of resources can you pull to help support you in your home environment to make that a bit easier? I think as well, often there's the assumption when you go back to work that you're back to normal. So a lot of the support will pull away. The spaghetti bolognese will stop being delivered on, <laughs> on the doorstep. Um, you know, the, the teenage kids that might have done the dishwasher will definitely stop doing the dishwasher at that point. So just letting people know that you know, this is going to take a whole load of more energy and can we still have some of those support services mm. in place mm -hmm. for a longer term. So don't be afraid to ask that. No. <laughs> so there's a couple of questions Annie's put up here. Um, so again, the peripheral neuropathy, which was the question anyone dealing with peripheral neuropathy. I, I think am. There was, you are? <laughs> yeah. And there was a few questions came up about that and we haven't really addressed it. I'm how do sure you find it affects you then? What, what, how do you notice it? Yeah, I mean, you notice it all the time. Okay. It's there. The so time. work is it turning pages? Is it? Yeah, and it's like it. It was kind of learning to type, not learning to type again, but yeah. it's just the keyboard feels different. Yeah. And yeah, just papers and certain surfaces mm -hmm. would upset. I don't have pain associated with it, so I'm lucky. Mm -hmm. um, it can be quite painful and still goes on to be cold sensitive mm -hmm. after treatment. But um, this is just something I'll have. So how do you cope with, <laughs> you said we're the experts, you're the expert. Yeah, I'm not yeah. the expert. <laughs> I don't know you are. So how do you cope with that if you're sitting and you're typing and it's particularly bad? Yeah, I think, it, I really like the idea of self-compassion, mm. kind of being kind to yourself. Yeah. It's a, you're a new new and you know, and you're, it, being of a working age is challenging enough, let alone being of working age and having this chronic condition. You really do need to adjust what you expect of yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think I just had to go through a process of it's okay that I'm not as fast as I used to be and, mm -hmm. and would have those conversations with people mm -hmm. so that I took some of that pressure off. Mm -hmm. I think that was great advice from both of you. Yeah. And the other question was, does it get better? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it does. There's the answer. <laughs> it does get better. Mm -hmm. Yep, definitely. Okay. So now... So as far as resources go, apart from this resource of the webinar, um, Cancer Council, we have a lot of online resources, the little books, so there's one called Cancer Work and You, which is available, it's printed, it's um, online, and there's also available, I'm not sure if this one's an e-book, but we've got quite a few e-books we're now producing, so you can download to your Kindle or iPad or whatever. We have a lot of fact sheets about how colleagues can su support people coming back to their workplace. Um, 
so it's the information is for employers and for the person that's been, you know, had the treatment and coming back to work. Plus there's online support with um, our telephone support groups, peer support groups, um, and all those sorts of things. And here's just a few, Headway Health, which is where Catherine works at, and they have, in the other slide you saw, they have three different locations where you can go and there's dietary information. Yeah, we've got a nutrition and cancer clinic with yep. an accredited dietitian. We've also got a team of psycho um, clinical psychologists that spend all day, every day, helping mm -hmm. people adjust and, and helping people learn strategies to deal with the different challenges at different points yep. of, di mm -hmm. of the disease yep. and, and recovery. So that's a place to go and just look at your, you know, your human rights, the Bowel Cancer Australia website has got some great resources. If you're looking at the depression and anxiety, most of you might have heard of the Black Dog Institute. Medicare, I guess, to get, you know, care plans and referrals, yep, psychology, a, a lot of allied health professionals, yeah. dietitians, mm -hmm. um, yeah. psychologists. Cancer Australia website's got heaps of great information. Macmillan, which is a, an English um, organisation, they have some really great workplace resources there. And this here, which Naomi would be familiar with, and it's another great website, is the Australian, I can't quite read. Australian Association, Association of Dermal Therapy Nurses. Nurses. Yeah. So they you go on there. They've educational tools as well. That's right. They've got some, I was looking at the website today, and you go in there, there's all these resources, the places you can go to to yeah. get advice. Find Stomal Therapy Nurses if you want one. If you're going to a different state, they'll actually tell mm. you where the yeah. therapist is in that state. Yes, yeah, so it's a national, mm. national website. So there's a lot of stuff there for you. Um, we're two minutes over time. And of course, the good old cancer information support 13, 11, 20. So in, if you've got any questions tomorrow that you would like answered, ring up and talk to them. And then of course, Lifeline, if you feel like you need to speak to somebody after the presentation tonight on 13, 11, 14. Um, so that's the end. We have an exit survey. We would love you to um, participate in the survey. It helps us planning for our future webinars and um, just get a bit of feedback and see how we went tonight. So thank you very much and look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. And thank you to the panel for coming tonight. It's been fantastic. <laughs> thank you, thank you Ben, thank you, Naomi, Catherine. It's been really informative. Thank you. Thank you.